Merry Christmas. And a Happy New Year. <laughs> there we go. It's a good way to kick off the new year. That was powerful, wasn't it? I want to welcome everybody this morning. My name is Michael Thornton. I, uh, I serve here as uh, the director of the Ascent University three-year discipleship school. And I'm also here with our senior leader, Chad Norris, who serves as the senior pastor over the Garden Greenville. Let's give him a hand this morning. <laughs> We're going to have a little fun this morning. How about that? Awesome. Um, before we get going, we have an incredible topic that we're going to talk to you today about. Um, but before I do, I want to share a fun fact that I have about Chad. I was, I was raised under the tutelage of my mom and my Italian grandmother from Sicily. So I grew up literally eating the best spaghetti and meatballs that you could ever imagine. And it's, it's literally my favorite meal. It's my, it's my go-to meal. And I don't think I've ever met a person in my life who actually shares the same level of passion and love for spaghetti and meatballs until I met Chad Norris. I was playing golf. Someone recently, I don't remember who it was, and they asked me what my death row meal was, which caught me off guard. I was like, my death row meal? Like the last meal I would ever eat. And I said, spaghetti. I I absolutely love it. Um, Real quick story. Earlier in the year, some of our families got together, and we had a, uh, a pasta dinner. Um, timing was perfect because my mom had just come into town and my mom made her homemade sauce. And so Amber got the meatballs and we, and we cooked the pasta and we all had a pasta dinner. And I remember gathering around the table right before we eat. And I said, Chad, doesn't that look incredible? And Chad looks and he goes, I'm emotional right now. (laughs) I mean, I I can see the tears welling up. And uh, I thought, wow, I have finally found somebody that loves pasta as much as I do. John, John Maxwell says you become who you hang around. (laughs) <laughs> like spirits attract. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Oh, come on now. All right, here's a side note. All right, I got to throw this in there. So in the Italian families, Parmesan cheese is very important. You got st- to stop. <laughs> I, gotta, I have to do this. It is, it is, it is, it was currency in my house growing up. And so there was only a certain level of Parmesan cheese you could use. So this is a tip. Anybody's cooking pasta this Christmas season, you have to use Locatel. Locatel Parmesan cheese is the only Parmesan cheese you could use in a pasta meal. So I know this is getting off track, but that is good to know. <laughs> getting hungry right now. Uh, a minute ago, I mean, I was really bonding with the Lord. I really was just telling the Lord some stuff. But you know how you can't keep thoughts from drifting? And I literally was thinking through where I want to go to lunch after, <laughs> after this. How many of you thought about lunch today during worship? See, look at this. Look at this. Get your hands back up. My people. Yeah, I mean, it's just being honest. You know, the number one metaphor in the Bible of kingdom is feasting. Some of y'all fast so much, you got to run around the shower to get wet. (laughs) I tell you what, with a 40-day fast coming up, it could be a rough next couple of weeks before that thing. Mm. How many of you, like, have a game plan before a 40-day fast? Hallelujah. I go through, I look at all these flags. I'm like, I'm going to eat Vietnamese on Monday. It's Indian. Oof. What are we talking about? That's awesome. I'm trying to stay focused right now because I really love food. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'm excited. Uh, we're going to actually talk about a message today, a conversation topic that I believe is uh, probably one of the most difficult and, and gets probably um, confused and presented in, in such a bad way. And it's the message of the fear of the Lord. It's a message that a lot of times we don't like to talk about because either we've heard it in a bad way or frankly, we just don't, just don't know much about it. Um, I want to really encourage you. What I'm really excited about is that Chad actually just released his new book. God is shaking his temple. Come on. And the tagline is, the fear of the Lord is returning to the church. So I'd love to kick this off because the fear of the Lord is a message that's been burning in your belly for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd love for you just to take a few moments and just begin to unpack um, how did this, when did he start dealing with you with this message and and how was it released in this book? Uh, June 1996, I had an encounter with God. I thought I was going to literally die. 
his presence manifested in a room I was in. Um, when I say that it was intense, I wasn't scared in the way that you think scared. I was so up under the glory that I couldn't breathe. And in my spirit, he showed me a picture of Isaiah 6, when uh, the glory of God enters the temple. He has been on me about the fear of the Lord strongly since then. So then the, you know, the million dollar question is, what is the fear of the Lord? Well, for 1999, you can figure out what the fear of the Lord is. But um, <laughs> This morning, the Holy Spirit woke me up. And I have a literary mentor over the years, Andrew Womack. I don't know Andrew. And uh, I haven't listened to him forever. And the Holy Spirit led me to a teaching he has on the fear of the Lord. I didn't know this until today. There's 600 passages on fear in the New Testament. Wow. 300 of them are on fear of the Lord, and the other 300 are on the opposite side of fear. And so the question is, what is the fear of the Lord? And this is the way I describe the fear of the Lord. It's a, just a tremendous respect, honor, and obedience to the one who is my sovereign king. And Michael, this is a personal reflection on the fear of the Lord. Um, I had an encounter with the Lord on my back porch three years ago. He told me what my assignment was to clean up rubbish in a particular stream, the spirit field stream, which that doesn't really go over well because people think, who the heck do you think you are? But I have to be obedient to the Lord. And what's happened is there's been such an overemphasis on our sonship and daughtership uh, that I can't tell you the last time I heard a sermon on hell, the last time I heard a sermon on sin, the last time I heard a sermon on the judgment seat of Christ. And so I've had the pleasure to get refined by his fire. And I've been through more warfare than anything in my life to write that book. It was very difficult. And that book is a look at what does it look like for me not just to receive his love, but also do what he says, when he says, and how he says it, knowing that one day I, not my family, not Sammy, Ruthie, Jack, Wendy, I will stand before the Bema seat of Jesus Christ. And what's done in the body will be revealed and I will be rewarded based upon what I have done, not what I believed, not just receiving love from Abba. Uh, he woke me up. I heard his audible voice four years ago. He screamed my name twice. He said, Chad, Chad, there are millions in my church who believe they are regenerated and they are not. And so prophets are very rarely enjoyed on the earth. You only celebrate them when they're dead. And this really... This book is a, uh, a prophetic declaration that the end time move of God will not look like just focusing on sonship. It will look like focusing on the raw majesty, beauty, glory, dominance, hugeness of God. You know, Shema is the oldest Hebraic prayer in the world. The Shema, the word, hear and obey, in the, in the Jewish sense, uh, Jews had no, I, there was no concept that you could hear God and not do what he says. So I tell my three children all the time, I really don't have a plan for you three. I will support you three as long as you do one thing. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and then he will direct your path. That's the fear of the Lord. Man, that's incredible. Um, there's so much that you said. I, I want to I like dive deep into this because this is a really good conversation. Um, being around Ascent, um, Chad taught a class a few times uh, called Breaking Intimidation. Yep. And uh, it was phenomenal. One of, the, one of the great revelations and truths that came out of that class was on this topic of the fear of the Lord. And I remember Chad speaking, and it really resonated with our students really well, all of us, really. And it was this. It was that, um, maybe I'm, I'm going to get it right, that... When we fear the Lord, mm -hmm. we don't fear man anymore. Mm -hmm. But if we have a fear of man, we really don't fear the Lord. Mm -hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, he told me in the shower a few years ago, I want to teach you to walk without crutches. And I said, crutches? And that's plural. And um, one of the crutches, I, 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 I sort of knew it. I mean, we, we don't know what's in the heart, but we do kind of know ourselves to some degree. I knew that I, my core need was not really ambition or appetite. I thought it was. It was really approval, going back to a little boy. My dad told me, he said one time, he said, I can't believe you went into ministry because you used to get your feelings hurt so easily as a child. And so what the father did is took me through a season of so much disapproval 
w- really, though, it wasn't about people. It was about me and him. He showed me that I had a literal idol in my life of approval. Wow. You know, there's so many people that we live our lives looking for the approval of anyone other than the Father. So if you struggle with ambition, here's what he'll do. He'll usually shut doors down in the marketplace for you. And no matter what you touch, it just won't grow. He'll starve you of that. If you struggle with approval, guess what he'll do? He'll send a lot of people across your path that don't like you. And um, for me, I, I really did. I, I, Wendy and I prayed yesterday. I had some time of prayer. I really thank the Father for this past season. I've, uh, even today, you and me were praying up here about this message going out to the world and different avenues. What, what he did for me, and that's why John Bevere's book helped me so much, Breaking the uh, Spirit of Intimidation, wow. he made me face an idol in my life. Mm. It would be great if we were delivered in one second. Wouldn't that be fun? Usually most of us are delivered slowly. This place has turned in really to like a rehab center. Mm. And uh, I've been slowly delivered. But I tell you, you can really feel when that death blow comes mm. to whatever it is you struggle with. And I've, I really feel like in this season the death blow has come to that. So what does that have to do with the fear of the Lord? I'm not going to stand before anyone other than Jesus wow. and who at the, at the Bema seat. I mean, I just... You know, where are your accusers going to be? Where, where is even the opinion of spouse, kids, past, grandparents, parents? I just scrolled through, Michael, some verses. These are just a few. I'm just going to read them out. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Um, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time it goes into why do you judge others? Uh, Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. This is my point, Michael. He sends us through seasons of refinement because he's more interested in the long game than the short game. Most of us in here feel like we have to hurry up to finish our assignments. What if your life on earth is just an internship for what you will be doing for all eternity? Mm -hmm. So what the devil will do is he will put things in front of you to try to get your attention off pleasing the only one that matters to please. And then we get there one day really realizing we live most of our lives fearing everyone but God. And fearing God is to do what he says, when he says, and how he says it. Genesis 22, to me, is the best picture I've ever seen of fearing God. The promise of Isaac manifests. He's probably around 12 years old. And God says, kill him. Soren Kierkegaard wrote the book, Fear and Trembling, never could get over that. And you know what Abraham did early the next morning? It's doing what he says, when he says, and how he says it. And a lot of us don't see breakthrough because we honestly don't fear God. I have been on a slow journey of giving God my food. I used to think it was cute and funny. And then he began to show me that as an idol. So this book is a, is a personal reflection on... It's, It's awful to write because it's so hard. It's a personal reflection on what does it look like to walk without crutches. So what does that mean? I'm yours every day. I'll do what you say, when you say, and how you say it. Man, I think that's that's amazing. The, um, you know, when we think of the fear of the Lord, like that word fears, we automatically go to a negative connotation. Obviously, there's a side of it that is, right? I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and the sound mind. However, what you started with earlier too, the definition of the word fear also has another side to it. That's in the dictionary. And it also means deep respect, reverence, and awe. Mm -hmm. And this is the side that is powerful and is redeemable. I've always felt like the fear of the Lord should never drive you away from God, but to him. And the thing that I've learned about the fear of the Lord in some of those verses you were just mentioning, Chad, is that the Solomon, the wisest man in the world, a lot of the fear of the Lord passages are found in the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. So there's this connection between wisdom and the fear of the Lord. And I want to read this verse and I want to ask you a question about it and see what you see what you get. Um, This is Proverbs chapter eight, which is actually the wisdom chapter. And in the middle of that, it says in verse 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Guys, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. For I, the Lord, hate pride arrogance in evil behavior and per- perverse speech. And some things that stretch this theolo- theologically is that there's biblical evidence that there's some things God actually hates, which is a strong word. Pride, arrogance, perverse speech, right? C.S. Lewis says there's sins of the spirit, sins of the flesh. But Solomon is saying this is a definition of what the fear of the Lord looks like is to hate what God hates. Why do you think, Chad, why do you think 
the Lord has such a hatred in his heart or, or however you want to put that towards things like pride and arrogance where maybe we would look at it and say, well, um, using drugs, um, gambling, or some of these external sins where it seems like the Father has really been on these type of sins. What are your thoughts on that? Any healthy marriage needs on an ongoing basis uh, outside eyes, coaching. Any healthy leader, we all need uh, outside eyes and coaching. But when we look at our relationship, if I look at my relationship with God as though me and him are in counseling, I lose. The only way, because if we're incompatible, it's not on his end. So the, the main desire on my life, like I love to pray, but the main desire in my life is to say, Father, teach me how you think about everything. And my job is to make his normal my normal. Here's the problem. This flesh suit is annoying, right? And so when I start saying, God, what is your norm? Most of the time, it will greatly contradict my norm. For example, you mentioned a passage about the six things he hates, seven he detests. Yes. In there a couple of times, the whole gossip and slander idea. Here's the way you know if you fear the Lord. A lack of fear of the Lord will all, always manifest in one way. You will treat poorly the authorities that God has given to lead you. So Romans 13, his word, doesn't really matter what anyone else in here thinks. His word says all authority is appointed by God. So every time you get on Facebook or Instagram and you slam the president of the United States of America, you already do not believe Romans 13. I don't care who's president. When you go after your teacher, your coach, your parents, your pastor, your governor, you're, what you're saying there is, and I can, I can feel it triggering people right now, even in here. What you're saying is you do not believe in Romans 13. So the idea is to take that scroll, eat it, and say, God, make your norm my norm, and I will bend the knee to my own flesh, and I will acclimate and live my life in uh, submission posture to you. But what we do is we return the favor. God created us in his own image. We have created him in our image. So we will bash anybody and everybody. We will have our own opinion, but yet we will come to the altar as though everything's okay. That word says if you have anything against anybody in your life and you are holding judgment and unforgiveness, why are you giving me your offering? What do you want me to do with this? So it's like, every time I'm in the Word, it doesn't just give me the fuzzies. I'm going, okay, Lord, refine me more. Refine me more. This is the message of the narrow road. There are millions of people in American churches that think they're regenerated and they're okay. They're not. And so I have an option. I can either speak what the Father's telling me to speak or be a coward like most other people, but I really want to stand in front of the judgment seat one day and say, hey, I did my job. He's made me a tender person that doesn't like conflict. And every time I open my mouth, I'm warning. I feel like Jeremiah. I'm just warning. There is such a warning to his church in America right now. He is removing lead priest. He's removing the pastors, the leaders. There's been a celebrity spirit that has infiltrated his church. So to answer your question, what is your norm? And how do I acclimate, acclimate my life to your norm? It will put you on your face. He's God Almighty. Remember when uh, he, he, he resurrects? and he I'm getting goes, stirred up right now. Remember when he goes and finds Simon? Mm -hmm. And Simon goes, what about this guy? He's talking about John. So he forgives Simon Peter. And the Lord said, you don't worry about John. When you were young, you did whatever you wanted to do. As you get older, they're going to drag you to where you don't want to go. Wow. The fear of the Lord is saying, I don't even care if I die over this. I read a passage in Revelation this morning. Revelation 3 or 20, I can't remember. It says, the devil is coming to throw some of you in jail. It will last for 10 days, persevere even unto your death, so that when you cross the other side, you will be given a crown of life. This is a literal word I have right now. Some of you will literally lay down the crown that was ordained for you to have because you did everything but fear the Lord while we're here. This message will shrink churches. It will shrink your friendships. And it will make you a little bit nervous. We've gotten so comfortable with God as though he's Buddy the Elf. I love Disney World. I love it. Like, I'm, I love it. If I had money, I'd go all the time. When you walk into Disney, they blow cinnamon in your face. I mean, it just makes me happy. Yeah, I love it. We have created a culture of like, oh, it's all covered, bro. He only calls out the gold. Which is such a contradiction to most of the New Testament, isn't it? 
I mean, when you read Peter and Paul's letters, I mean, they talk. How many passages you say were fear of the Lord in the New Testament? Uh, about 300 on fear of the Lord. In the, in the whole Bible, there's way more than that. And so in this book, I talk about a judgment inside the new covenant. You know what we don't do? We just don't read the New Testament for ourselves. And so we'll turn on a... a let's be honest. I don't want to be down. I want to be happy. But what's happened is we'll just find messages that make us just feel happy. If you read the New Testament, every page in the New Testament ought to make you go, Ooh, Lord, refine me more. Refine me more. Because some of us think we're all good, bro, and you're not all good, bro. Ask Ananias and Sapphira how it works. People say, well, the father poured out his judgment on Jesus. Yes, he did for the atonement. But to say that there's not a judgment still released in the new covenant is a, it is witchcraft. Wow. Think, you're the one that introduced to me two years ago when I started reading 1 Peter. And you were talking, why don't you talk about that for a second, how the judgment of God starts in the house first. Mm-hmm. The, it, first Peter says it real clear that the judgment of the, of the Lord always starts in the house of the Lord first with the elders and then works its way out. I mean, that's in Ezekiel 8 and it's in 1 Peter and um, it's, just, it's just part of what he does. And I believe the reason why is because the more we are awakened to truth, the more responsible we come, become to carry it out. And so there's a higher standard. There's a higher level. It's like if you have children in here, as your children grow up, there's higher responsibilities that you have for your kids. And also, if they mess up, there's, there's also a higher level of accountability that comes with that. It's the same way with the fear of the Lord. That's the message that, that Peter was talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a timely message. And here's what I also want to bring into this conversation is that this isn't the only house this is coming from. I mean, there are global leaders, global voices right now where the Father is literally putting the same message mm. of the fear of the Lord because this is a message he is like literally shouting from the rooftops in his church and his bride right now. It is a, this message is a global message. It's not just for like Greenville in this local area. It's for a global church, a global bride because the reality is he is coming back. And we all believe he's not coming back for a bride that's going to be worrying, not going to be broken and all. It, the bride is going to be fully in love with him. And part of that love looks like the fear of the Lord. This is, I feel the fire right now. Guys, the fear of the Lord is, introduces you to the fire of God. The fear of the Lord is the open door to the fire of God. That's how the fire of the Lord burned in my life. It's because he taught me to fear the Lord, like a healthy fear of the Lord. When he said those things, hate, I hate those things. I remember early on coming out of drug addiction. When I saw the reality of what crack cocaine and heroin and all the things that I partook in destroyed my family, destroyed my relationships. And behind that was selfishness that I partnered with. And I asked God, put a hatred in my heart for that because I don't want to participate that way anymore. That prayer in the first two and three years of my recovery literally gave me strength to overcome the cravings and urges of using drugs. But it's a healthy fear of the Lord. Armando, are you in here? I just, uh, I just texted you a video and I want you to show it while I tell the story. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, one real quick on your phones. Um, I've all, I've, I love the word, but I love what the word says. Um, strongest gift I walk in is prophecy, but it didn't fall on me. It's not sovereign. I don't tell the story. First Corinthians 14, one says, pursue love and eagerly desire all the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. I love prophecy. I love it. I was on the phone with my mentor, Mike Hardigree, two weeks ago. Well, around here, I just, I don't know. I think it's funny. I say, hey, you know, we went into a swirl. I went into a swirl. What does that mean? Where God just starts speaking and he's telling you a bunch of stuff and you're just enjoying conversation with him. I love it. I'm prophesying to Mark, my car degree on the phone about how God loves to use animals to confirm truth in the natural of what he's doing. So like when Bob Jones went to IHOP back in the day and before God started exploding at uh, IHOP, Bob said to Mike, the animals are going to start showing up, name the different animals, and they started coming on property. This is, this is, one, this is an encounter. It actually scared me. I, at first I thought it was, uh, I thought it was like a Great Dane or like a, you remember the movie Turner and Hooch? Oh, yeah. Tom I thought Hanks. it was that big fat dog. I am prophesying to Mike, and when I really get in a swirl and get going, I just, um, 
I just start rock, rocking. And while I prophesied that God uses animals to confirm things in the natural when he's especially movementally, because I was just talking about them. I was just talking about a lot of stuff that God was about to do in my life, uh, this church. D do you have it, Armando? Can you play it? This happened. Turn, the, um, turn it down. Can y'all see that back there? All right, you see that deer? That is a six or eight point buck. Guys, I live in a neighborhood. I don't live on a farm. I, it scared me so bad, I almost cussed. Uh, it stares at me. And you say, what is the point? The point is, while we were on the phone, I was talking about the shift of the church. This God is shaking his temple. What he's doing globally with the model of church. People say, why, why do you have tables in the sanctuary? Well, just go read 1 Corinthians. This is a Constantine stage. We put stage actors on stage. Since when did we stop talking to each other and all of us doing the works of the Lord? That's just one part. I'm just starting to declare this stuff prophetically. And a deer walks up. What's my point in all of this? God has been going overboard lately to confirm to me that, that the message of this book, it's him. Um, I walked into an office complex not too long ago, and I looked at this executive, and I just stared at him, and I said, you have unforgiveness and judgment towards your father, and if you don't get it right, heaven is about to stop flowing to you. And if you'll confess it and get it right, heaven will open up. You see, when you fear the Lord, you'll give people hard words. So there's a statement going around the charismatic church that we're only called to call the gold out in each other. Says who? Who came up with that? Have you read the Bible? <laughs> Prophets are a little bit scary. So what God has had me in a, a season of growing in love and empathy, you and others have really just helped me just get connected to the gospel, uh, loving myself, loving others, being tender. At the same time, the other side of that coin is there is a sharp sword coming from heaven right now. And it is separating the sheep from the goats. It is separating, separating those literally that think they're in Christ and not. God, I write about it in the book. God had me go prayer walk Gettysburg, and I never knew until I started writing the book. And here's why he had me do it. Gettysburg was necessary before, I think, the greatest act in any president in American history, the abolishment of slavery. Guess what happened before all that happened? Gettysburg. Right now, we're in a Gettysburg season in the church. There's great fighting inside, specifically the charismatic church. I was with Jeremiah Johnson two weeks ago. He had death threats for apologizing about how he was wrong about Trump. Death threats. There are prophets, in, prophets inside the charismatic stream that are at war with each other. I've never seen this much division over a, a, a cloth around your face, a vaccine, a booster, a political candidate. I'm here to declare what I see and what God has shown me is we're in a Gettysburg season. And on the other side of this, I really do believe with my entire heart that we will live to see an enormous reformation outpouring of God. Alex Rodriguez sent me a text last week. He said, Chad, I'm telling you, it's coming. I see it. But before it happens, you're seeing a great shaking. Do you understand how many people have left the church in the last two years? And it, what, what's happened is we, have, we are more obsessed about the pandemic than even we are plugging into local bodies. The Father is shaking this thing, and you're watching a remnant church rise. That is a definition of the fear of the Lord. That's amazing. Um, right before we wrap up, you know, you just said something there that I want to highlight um, about this global movement that we know is, it's like God is here, but he's coming. And... We were in uh, our year three Rama class and we just got done walking through basically church history. And we went from book of Acts all the way to every revival movement from church history, 2000 years. And we just ended the class on the Toronto outpouring in 1994 uh, with Randy Clark and John Carroll Arnott. But what usually if people don't connect is that at the same time, there was another outbreak in Pensacola, Florida in the Brownsville revival in 1995 on Father's Day. And you have these two movements, one in Toronto, one in Pensacola, Florida, but the movements were so heaven born. I mean, so much fruit came out of it, but they were also different and unique. It's, I can't remember if somebody said that you went to Toronto and you received daddy's love. Life. 
and then you went to Brownsville, and what would happen? No, you got a spanking. And you got a spanking. Because it was Father's love in Toronto, dealing with the orphan spirit, healing the heart, Father loves you. Powerful. But there's even more to God, more another side to him than that. And that was just displayed in Brownsville, where there was more conviction of sin, more weeping and shaking and trembling at the altars. So much so that the churches were just completely filled out, out the door. The point in that is that the fear of the Lord is God himself. This is a side of the Lord that he is putting on display at a global level for his bride in this hour. Wendy and I had breakfast a while back with John and Carol Arnott and Duncan and Kate Smith. And Carol's the one that preached at Bethel Church about five years ago that the next move of God would not look like Toronto and that it was all about the fear of the Lord and the fear of the Lord's returning center stage. You know what she's saying there? God's coming back to his church. We, we have gotten, a lot of churches turned into entertainment, let's be honest. And it's a consumer culture. And um, I believe that persecution, I believe what's happening politically and what will happen down the road is actually a blessing to the church. Historically, when God's church is pressed really hard, uh, I'm not afraid of the government getting involved with shutting churches down because when that happens, it is predictable. There will be an explosion because the remnant church is rising. It's so powerful. So true. Um, as we close here, Chad, what are some practical steps, practical takeaways that folks online here today yep. can take away about how to actually grow and cultivate the fear of the Lord? I am not being funny at all when I say this. Every one of you will die. Um, I, I helped officiate a wedding yesterday of one of God's good friends. And did I, did, did I really? Wow, that was for you. I didn't mean to do that. I did not mean to do that. That was awesome. If you're at the funeral, that'll make sense. Can you believe I just said that? Daniel told us, Daniel's mama's funeral was yesterday. And he told a story that every time he goes to say funeral, he'd say wedding. I can't believe I just did that. Um, maybe God's real. Uh, practical steps, not being funny at all. You will die. Be at peace. Just kidding. All right. You will die. You will stand. You will stand. Please research it yourself. Read my chapter on the judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before Jesus Christ. That helps bring everything into focus. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. Because the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with your past sins, by the way. It, your your uh, renegade season? Uh-uh. The judgment seat of Christ, there's three judgments in the Bible. This one, the beam of seat of Christ, is for those of us inside of Christ. It's not about my sins. It is about what did I do with my life after I received him into my life. So if he's Buddy the Elf and he's giving you something to do and you said no and you're doing your own thing, just know you're going to stand before him one day. That brings everything into focus for me, Michael. That's the first step. Second step is surround yourself with people who do fear the Lord. You will become, five years from now, you will be the result of the books you read and the people you hang around. I have seen this over and over and over and over. If you hang around people who gossip and slander, a hundred times out of a hundred, it will take you down. If you have a Messiah complex thinking you're going to save that person, it will never happen. So who you hang around, you will become. Hang around people who fear the Lord. Wow, that's so good. Hey, um, can I give this away? Yeah, absolutely. Daniel, yeah, I, I want to give it, huh? Before you do, though, can we, I want to, I feel like to pray. I want to pray over this book, and then we'll yeah. give it away. Yeah, do it. Um, and then we'll have communion. This, as you were just talking, I felt, I felt like the message in this book is so timely and powerful. Like we said, it's, a, it's for a global bride. And I want to agree um, with Chad, and I want you to agree with me in prayer right now that this book will literally impact the globe. As a fellow author, I know the time and the effort that it takes to write a book. Mind you, he's in a doc doctoral program. I'm also in a doctoral program. To write a book on the side is unbelievable. Um, and that just shows you how much the Spirit of God is in this message and on this book. So just for a second, I want you to agree with me right now. Father, we agree for the message in this book. We know that the fear of the Lord is a revelation that you are releasing in the earth right now. And this is, we're coming up on 2022. And right now I prophesy Isaiah 22, 22, that this will be the year of the open door. This will be the year of the open opportunity for this message to impact 
impact churches, organizations, the marketplace, governmental leaders, world leaders, um, uh, every area of politics, every area of the marketplace in the church. I, I ask right now that you would open up doors, open up opportunities, uh, open up ventures where this book will find itself resting on the desk of very, very influential people. We know that this is your heart. We agree for what you're doing in this place through Chad, through this house, and through this book. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said amen.